I don't even think that's a minute, but I'm going to start talking again because it's getting awkward. I, speaking of awkward, we read that passage from Isaiah, Isaiah about, you know, seeing eye to eye, whole new significance for me uh, from this past week. So I'm doing my best Coach Zimmer look. I don't know if you remember his eye issues, was it last year, and all this weird media coverage. So I had an eye issue this past week. And it was um, a week to remember or forget, depending on how, how you, I'd like to forget it. But anyway, weird stuff with my eye. My vision is messed up. It looks like I was in a bar fight for New Year's, okay? And I promise you, I was not in a bar fight. Never been in one. Don't know what it's like. But my vision is messed up. So uh, I, uh, I had to punt for as far as preaching this morning, because I really couldn't see anything this past week. But I'm getting better, enough about me. Hank, come on up. Uh, a friend of ours, Hank Griffith, is preaching this morning. Uh, it's been a while since Hank has been here, but he has preached at City on a Hill in the past. Uh, I didn't know who would be available between Christmas and New Year's, and it's whatever, 50 below outside. <laughs> you know, who, you know it's, it's, it was a tough week. Uh, so grateful for Hank and his friendship and his desire to serve our church. Uh, so we welcome you back to City on a Hill. Thank you, Hank, for making the time and uh, just blessings on you as you preach the word this morning. I'll get out of your way. Thank you, Bruce. It's great to be here. And as Bruce said, it's been quite a while. I enjoy this little church uh, and you are brave souls. I'm amazed. I was kind of prepared for 10 or 15 people, and you just keep coming in. I'll tell you a little secret. Now, Randy, you, you're also from the South. I spent my first 20 years in Florida, northern Florida. And then we spent almost 18 years in Zaire, along the equator. However, we've been here a long time. So I have no excuse for uh, not being here. It's great to be here, and it's great that uh, there are other brave souls here. Well, I am uh, looking at a passage... I'll, I'll tell you a little secret here. When I got a call from Gene on Wednesday night, I was thinking, you know, Sunday's coming. <laughs> Preachers <laughs> think that, don't they? Sunday is a coming. Uh, and I begin to think, you know what? I've got a series going at the rivers where I'm the volunteer chaplain on Highway 13 in Burnsville. I, I'm there every Tuesday and Wednesday. And uh, I just preached about a great guy named Simeon. And uh, I think it might preach here too. So I tweaked that sermon a little bit to change it from a, you know, a nursing home uh, setting. <laughs> that wouldn't work for you folks. <laughs> change it to a church setting. So it's a great passage. Uh, I would invite you to look at God's Word, uh, Luke chapter 2. Oh yeah, there is something here. Uh, when uh, Barry and Dan told me that I'd be able to see what, and I was thinking be able to see myself, that'd be scary. I thought, he, they said, you'll be able to see what he, they see. And I said, oh no, I don't want to see myself. <laughs> it's the passage of Scripture, and that's the one we're reading. So Luke chapter 2, verses 21 to 35. Luke 2, 21 to 35. By the way, uh, apologies, I do use the NIV, New International Version there, uh, so I just kept it in the NIV at, at our church, South Suburban, and, and here I know you use ESV, but it's all God's Word. It's all God's inspired Word, so I don't... Okay. Thank you, Bruce. I was feeling kind of... <laughs> Kick me out. Yeah. <laughs> NIV, <laughs> it's all over. <laughs> okay, thank you, Bruce. Luke 2, verse 21. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus. The name the angels had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord. A pair of doves are two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. 
When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for the revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your inspired word. Even as the Holy Spirit inspired men of old, we ask that your spirit would illumine our hearts to understand your word today, not just to understand it, but to believe it and to act upon it. And may you get all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Simeon's Savior, our title for today. Now, we're not really focusing on an old man named Simeon. We're focusing on his Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, when I, as I was thinking after I got the phone call on, on Wednesday night. I was saying, you know, hey, you know, I could continue on with, with Simeon and something I've just talked about. But then it hit me, eight days after Christmas, count them up. Eight days after Christmas. And how does the passage start? On the eighth day. So this even falls into place. And that was a confirmation. God wanted me to use this passage. It's the eighth day after Christmas. On the eighth day. Now, that's, that's important uh, for, for all Jewish people because there are two things that happened on the eighth day for a baby. Male baby would be circumcised. That was important. That goes way back to Genesis 17. Abraham and then his son Isaac were circumcised. It's a sign of the covenant. Very important sign that uh, that child, that Jewish child, is part of God's covenant family. But also, there was something else that was done on that day. The name of the child was made public. It wasn't until then that the name of the child was made public. Think about the story in John 1 of John the Baptist's birth. Go back to, I think it's about uh, chapter 1, verse 51 or something like that. You remember uh, Zechariah, the father, was mute because he kind of doubted a little bit when the angel told him his wife would have a child. And on the day of the, on the eighth day, on the day that uh, he was circumcised, he was also named. You remember they had a little trouble with that. Uh, the mother said, his name is John. And everybody said, what? John, there's no John in your family. He should be Zachariah. And uh, they got into a little, you know, debate about that. And the father was standing over there. He couldn't talk. So they asked Zechariah, well, what do you think? So he motioned for paper. His name is John. And all of a sudden his mouth opened and he began to talk again. And that was his name. That's important. For the Jewish people, the eighth day is very important. The name is announced at that time. And um, so that, that's kind of the setting here. It was the eighth day when it was time to circumcise him. He was named Jesus. So all that falls together. By the way, they knew his name was going to be Jesus because you go back into Matthew, when the angel appeared to Joseph, he, he said his name would be Jesus. Jesus, by the way, is the same word as Joshua. That's the same. Jesus and Joshua are the same. Joshua, the Old Testament Hebrew, and Jesus in the New Testament Greek. And they mean God saves. The name Jesus' name means God saved. So the angel had announced the name to, to uh, Joseph. And then again, when the angel appeared to Mary... We see that in, in, in Luke. Uh, he also told them what the name would be. His name would be Jesus because he would be the Savior. Continuing on in verse 22, we're going on to another aspect of raising a Jewish child. When the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been accomplished. Now, the purification ritual was primarily for the mother. And the mother was, a Jewish mother was considered ceremonially unclean for 40 days. So that first week, the eight days, was circumcised, but 33 days after that, then the Jewish mother would go, if they were able, to the temple. And they were only, at that point, five or six miles from the temple, because Bethlehem and Jerusalem are just kind of next door. So it was easy for them, in this case, to go to the temple. So she had to 
go through a certain ritual, and they either had to bring a, a lamb uh, to offer, and that was for people who had a little more means, or two doves, two pigeons, and that's, that's what they did. So this is a purification ceremony, and it primarily uh, impacts the mother. So when the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, and I want to stop here, you'll see everything in this passage they're doing according to the law of Moses. Jesus Christ had to fulfill this, not just the moral law of the Old Testament, but the ceremonial law of the Old Testament. He had to do everything in order to be a perfect Savior. How could he die for our sins otherwise? So all this stuff is important. All these different things they're going through, they're doing it out of obedience to God's law so that Jesus, when he dies, he would be without sin. and Then he could take upon himself our sins to become our atonement. So he circumcised with their purification with his mother, all this according to God's law. And it says, as is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. You can look in your text. I think it's in uh, Exodus. You'll find that if you really want to go back to the Old Testament, it's all there. I won't go through that right now. But it's, it's required in the, law, in the law of the Lord that they do this. And 24, verse 24, and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. So that's what they brought as a sacrifice. So we've looked at the background. His parents did everything that they were to do according to the law of the Lord so that Jesus could be that perfect sacrifice. Now let's get into the the first point here. Simeon's life. Now, my sermon really isn't about Simeon. I told you that at the beginning. It's Simeon's Savior. But God's, God used this man. He's an older man, we think. By the way, we don't know for sure he's an older man. Um, the next person they meet in the, in the temple we know is older. It says that. Uh, Anna. But it really doesn't say the, the age of Simeon. We suppose he is because he's waiting to die. But we don't know. In fact, we don't know much about this guy. It's interesting with Anna... More details are given. We know Anna's father. We know Anna's tribe. But this guy just all of a sudden shows up on the scene there there in the temple. And we don't really know much about him except that. Let's see what it says about him. There was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous. Righteous. He lived a righteous life. Righteous has to do with behavior in the world. But also he was devout. Devout has to do with relationship to God. Righteous and devout. What else, what else could we want for, for those of us who are followers of Christ? That's my desire. I'm not always righteous and devout, but that's what I desire of my life. But that's who Simeon was. And then it adds something very interesting here that I think is important. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. You know, the good Jews were waiting for the Messiah to come. Oh, what a comfort that would be when the Messiah came. Now, their idea of a Messiah was often a little misconstrued. They kind of thought that, hey, we've been under the Babylonians, we've been under the Assyrians, we've been under the Greeks, we're under the Romans now. He's going to liberate us from this. He's going to set up his earthly kingdom. Well, they didn't quite understand what it meant to be the Messiah, but they were on the right track, and they were waiting. But I, I think Simeon, being a godly and righteous man, had a better understanding of it. So he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, the comfort that when the Messiah was come, that this was his prayer. Probably every day when he got up, this could be the day, Lord. And what else do we see about Simeon? I love this too. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. You know, there's a sense in which we're still under the old covenant here. The new covenant is launched at Jesus' death and, and resurrection, and then the Holy Spirit comes at Pentecost. And in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon people for certain tasks like upon kings, upon prophets. So it's, it's spoken very much in that context here. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. You know, he was walking closely to the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit spoke to him in some way. We don't know exactly how. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. The word Christ, Christos, means anointed one. That's the Messiah. So he's waiting for the anointed one. And, he, and that's an amazing thing. Uh, I'm sure for him, waiting for the consolation of Israel was even more than some of the other Jews because he knew that it would come, he would come before he died. 
So he was waiting. He'd love to see the Messiah, but it also connected with his own physical life, his death. So it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Holy Spirit. You know, he was filled with the Spirit. The Spirit was upon him. He was so close to God that the Spirit was able to work in and through him and guide him. And I hope that's the way we live our lives. I hope you're walking so closely with, with the Lord that the Spirit leads you step by step in your life. So it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. Apparently, he didn't do that every day. Now, Anna, it says, was there day and night. I, I, was, I was a little perplexed when I read that about Anna, and I went to some commentaries. They said, perhaps with certain widows, there were areas in the, because the temple courts were huge, there were areas maybe that, the, that these widows could even stay, you know, care for the widows and orphans. But Simeon, I don't think, lived at the temple, but he was led by the Holy Spirit to go to the, the temple courts, the outer area, only the temple, only the high priest could go into the inner area, and only once a year for the Holy of Holies. But um, this is the outer area of the courts. And what happens there? That's a little background on Simeon. Now we get to the second point, Simeon's prayer. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required. There again, we see it. They're doing everything according to the law. They're being totally obedient to the law so that Jesus can be our perfect sacrifice. So they come into the temple courts. And then, I don't know how, but I guess it was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit revealed to Simeon that this young couple holding this tiny newborn baby. This was the Messiah that he'd been waiting for, the Christ. He was there. And I don't know what he said to them, but it, all it says here in verse 28 is, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. What a privilege that was for this older gentleman. I think he's older. Hold this baby. And, and he knew who he was holding. He praised God and this is one of the most beautiful phrases for me in the whole scripture. Sovereign Lord, very, very common word. That, look it up in a concordance, you'll see the term sovereign Lord often throughout the Bible. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. This baby. This baby is God's salvation. God's provision of our salvation. I, I'm sure he was totally awestruck by that. And it kind of gives me goosebumps even saying it. This baby, it's God's salvation. He knew he would, would be sinners. He knew he wouldn't be lost. He knew he'd be separated from the Father. He knew he had to save us. And he saved us by sending a human baby. And Simeon had the privilege of holding God's salvation in his arms. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people of Israel. Jesus came both for the Gentiles and the Jews, for all people. And I think that might have been especially important for Luke as a Gentile uh, to write those words. He came for both Jews and Jews. Gentiles. He came for all who would receive him by faith. It's a beautiful prayer. We could go into it in more depth, but we won't. But then he did something even more interesting to me. He blessed the parents. As far as I know, this is the only example in the scripture where someone blessed Mary and Joseph. We move on to our third point, Simeon's blessing. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Now, did you gag just a little bit when I said child's father? Holy Spirit. He's conceived the Holy Spirit. But Joseph was his stepfather. He was his foster father. Joseph was a godly man who did a great job. So I don't think Luke is denying the virgin birth because he just talked about the virgin birth in the previous chapter. But from the human standpoint, he was God, Jesus father. So he speaks to the father and the mother, in other words, Joseph and Mary, and they marveled at what was said about him. They marveled at, 
I think they were still trying to understand. They both had an appearance from the angel, and, but I, I don't think they totally understood how special their baby really was. And they marveled at this gentleman that comes up to them in the temple said those things. And then Simeon did something very sweet, I would say. He blessed them. Bless them. Once in a while, somebody, a godly person, will, will bless you. Or maybe say, I'd like to pray for you. I'm sure, Bruce, you've had that. As a, as a servant of God, that's one of the most wonderful things, to have someone bless me through their words, through their prayers. He blessed them. And he said to Mary, his mother. Now, the next verses are hard. Um, they're not ones that I particularly enjoy reading and, and talking about, but all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for rebuke, for reproof correcting, and training in righteousness. All Scripture. So this is God's Word. Here's what he says. This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel. And that's absolutely true. There were those who received, and there were those who opposed. There was falling, and there was rising. Pastor Bruce alluded to that in his, in his sermon, that, that what's going on in many countries of the world, and I think is going to be increasing in our own country. I just read yesterday in a news magazine that the percentage of Christians, even, even professing Christians, has moved in the last few years from 70-something percent down to 62 percent. We're just gradual, and we're going to see it fall, fall, fall. People are willing that, to attach themselves to the name of Christ. It's destined to the cause of falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against. Jesus is a sign a sign of God that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. It begins to come clue. When we talked about the name of Jesus, I remember when I, I did quite a few funerals of elderly people when I was a chaplain in St. Paul. And I do remember one time there was a, a young couple there. Maybe they were grandchildren or great-grandchildren of this, of this lady. But I was talking about Jesus, which I always do. And I got to the point, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And this couple got up and walked out. It was very obvious why they walked out. It was very obvious. You can talk about God. Hey, people don't mind you talking about God. People talk, use his name all the time, sometimes not in the right way. But talk about Jesus, that's what, that's what gets people especially if you talk about him in a biblical sense. Jesus is a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. That's when you really see the heart of someone when you begin to talk to them about who Jesus is. Yeah, if you just talk about the baby in the manger, they won't say much. But you get to the point about who he is and what he claimed to be about himself, people don't like it. They say, that's too exclusive. We need to be more open to all. To say that he is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only way of save, being saved. It, people are repulsed. And we should expect that. We should expect that. As we get to our application, that's going to be my first point I'd like to leave you with, because I think it's very important. This prophetic blessing to Mary and Joseph really brings up something important, a great truth, that he will be the source of division among people. Yes, he unifies us in Christ, but in the world, Jesus is a source of division. Even families are divided over Jesus, and we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised. What did Jesus say? You don't have to look it up, but let me read it. Luke 12, verses 51 to 53. Do you think I've come to bring peace on earth? No, I've come to divide people against you. That's in the Bible. It's in the Bible. It really is. I'll read it again. Do you think I've come to bring peace to the earth? No, I've come to divide people against each other. From now on, families will be split apart. Three in favor of me and two against. Two in favor and three against. Father will be divided against son. Son against father. Mother against daughter. Daughter-in-law against mother. 
daughter-in-law against mother-in-law, daughter, and you get the point. That's what Jesus said. So should we be surprised when that's happening in our families? No, Jesus came to divide. Think about, it's easy for us to see in a Muslim context. A young man becomes a believer in Christ, he's ostracized. He can't come back. But it's happening in America. I shared with a, a good friend at South Suburban, I pray with this gentleman once a month, and I shared with him what I'd be preaching on. And he told me a little story. He said, he's a retired guy, but where he worked, downtown Minneapolis, uh, there was a, a man who uh, had cancer. And he really felt constrained to share the gospel with this man. He did, and the man accepted Christ. And, and, and my friend was ecstatic. And he began to, you know, disciple him and talk to him about the Lord. But you know what happened? This man goes home and tells his wife what he did, and, and, and she was irritated. It, it created a problem between this man and his wife. She felt her husband was being taken away from him. Friends, this is not something from some other country, Muslim country, Hindu country, Buddhist country. This is right here in America. Or the more, even more common thing is our young people, as they, they grow up in the church, they do all the right things, pray the right prayers, go through the right motions, go off to college, begin to hear other things, and then sometimes begin to get married. They marry a non-Christian, and you come back to the house at Christmas time and Easter time, and it's awkward. Families are divided. We shouldn't be surprised. Jesus told us this would happen. It's the cost of discipleship. So young people, I pray that you will put your faith in Christ and remain firm and walk with him all through. But you're going to have all kinds of stresses in your life that will draw you away from the Lord and make you think mom and dad are old-fashioned. This kind of stuff that you heard is narrow and unloving. But it's the gospel. It's God's truth. It's not mom and dad's ideas. This is from the Bible. So my first point, and, I, and the one I, I really want you to walk away from, from here with, is that Christ came to divide. Yes, he came to unify us in Christ. Well, we, we stand around talking to one another. We love one another. We, how can I pray for all you were concerned? But in the world, Christ came to divide. A couple of other things, just a little bit more pleasant things to think, think about. Um, Paul said to, uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow me as I follow the example of Christ. We have many good examples in the Bible of people to follow because they follow Christ. Simeon followed Christ. So that's a positive thing we can see. Uh, I'd love to be like Simeon. I mentioned that earlier. I'd love to be a righteous man. I'd love to be a devout man. I'd love to be a man who's looking forward to the second coming of Christ. So let's, let's follow the example of this godly man. But you know, the most important application from this sermon that I want you to get is not about Simeon. And that's why the Holy Spirit led me to, to entitle it Simeon's Savior. This is about, not about Simeon. It's about his Savior that he loved so much and he got to hold. He, he experienced, he saw, he held. And, and he was ready to, to go. He said, you may dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Have you seen God's salvation in your life? I hope you have. If you're a young person here today, just because mom and dad are Christians doesn't make you a Christian. You have to respond personally to the message of the gospel. You've got to accept Jesus personally into your heart. Have you seen Jesus? Have you experienced him? I pray that you have, and I ask that you would. Let's close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for Jesus. We, in a, in a million years, would never have come up with this plan, sending your salvation to be born as a baby in such an unusual way. But thank you, God, 
you showed us grace and mercy and sent your Son into this world. We receive him in faith and we follow him to the ends of the earth. In Jesus' name, amen.